Great. Let's continue then talking about what we started talking about last time, which was the convex hull ratio. And this is something that is a measurement of how weird a shape is. Measures how weird in the sense of like, I would say kind of wiggly, wormy a shape is. And it involves looking at what we call the convex hull of the shape. And we had a somewhat silly handout last time um, about convex hulls of a shape. So if I have a shape, something like this, this kind of lumpy thing, that is the original shape. The convex hull, I hope you remember from last time, maybe I'll just copy this draw it twice. So this is a shape. This down here, I'm going to draw its convex hull. And what that means is you fill in all the kind of inward um, intrusions of this shape. A very sort of simple um, intuitive way of thinking about it is you wrap a rubber band around this shape. The result is you get additional areas which are obtained by connecting, sort of closing off these inward regions with straight lines. They should be straight lines because you're imagining a, a rubber, the way a rubber band would wrap around this shape. And the rubber band, of course, would make straight lines across those gaps. It would not make any kind of curves across the gaps. So those, all right? So the convex hull is this entire shape now with those extra bits filled in. That is called the convex hull of the original shape, all right? And this is more or less where we left off last time. It is important to be able to draw the convex hull of any shape if you want to do this thing called the convex hull ratio, all right? What does this have to do with how wiggly and wormy a shape is? And this is a basic fact. And this is the principal use of the convex hull uh, in, our, in our situation. If I have a normal shape, that is not sort of wormy. Uh, a normal shape maybe looks something like that. This shape, if you make the convex hull, it would in this example involve adding in these two bits here and here, right? Extra parts here. I would say here, the convex hull, can I just write CH? The convex hull is fairly similar By similar, I mean by area <coughs> to the original shape, right? The original shape is kind of like that, that pear-like shape. The convex hull is that, plus additionally those two little bits of area. But I hope you agree in this example, the convex hull is fairly similar by area to the original shape. All you have to do to get the convex hull is add in these little two little bits of area, all right? Now, this is for a fairly normal shape. What about a sort of weird, wormy shape? A worm, a wormy shape. Well, so a wormy shape, I mean, you know, something like this. Something like that, right? Is it true that the convex hull is pretty close to the original shape? The answer is no. Like in this case, if I were to make the convex hull, I would have to close off this part and this part and probably a few other little wiggles. Maybe th there's a little wiggle over there, right? <coughs> you remember the wiggles from Aus Australian? Yeah. I went to their concert. Really? Mm -hmm. Nice. Was it around here? Uh, I, I was like 2000. Right. I well, I assumed it wasn't like last year. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. They always gave me bad vibes for some reason. Uh, anyway, uh, if you do the same thing for a wormy shape, you end up adding in these huge amounts of area, right? And I guess this little bit down here. Do you know there was a girl wiggle? I think one of the original wiggles was a woman. Yeah. Wiggle representation. It's important. All right. So this wormy shape here, the moral of the story is, here the convex hull 
is much bigger by area, is what I'm talking about, than the original shape. Right? The contrast is striking. If your shape is more or less like an ordinary shape to begin with, then the only difference is you have to add in maybe a little bit of area. But if you have some kind of ridiculous wormy shape, you end up having to add in a lot of area in order to make the convex hull. And this is the way we can measure specifically how wormy is the shape. So a shape's worminess I write that wiggliness can be measured specifically by how different the convex hull area is from the original area, right? If the convex hull is much bigger, it means the shape you started with must have been a crazy shape. But if the convex hull is only a little bit bigger, it means the shape you started with is probably a more or less ordinary shape. That's the idea behind the convex hull ratio. Now we say, this. I said this is about how different the convex hull area is. Usually in mathematics when you want to know how different two things are, like if they're numbers, like in this case they are numbers, they're areas, right? So you could just subtract the areas. Although we're not going to do this by subtraction. Uh, this is called the convex hull ratio which means instead of subtracting them, we're going to make a fraction out of it. It's really just as good, and actually there are technical reasons why it's better to make a fraction. So here's the definition. It's called the convex hull ratio. Convex hull ratio. And I'm going to sometimes write CHR, just because I don't want to write all those words. The convex hull ratio is... It is a fraction, it's a ratio, that's what ratio means. And the fraction is the original area divided by the convex hull area. This is the definition of the convex hull ratio. It's a fraction, and if you like, you know, as usual, you can convert this to a decimal. You can write it as a percentage if you want, all right? But let's just talk about if the convex hull is about the same size, so for a nice shape, these areas are about the same. So the convex hull ratio is close to, can anybody say, like as a number, if you have a fraction where the top and the bottom are more or less the same, what is the, what is the value of that fraction going to be? Yeah, close to one, right? If the numerator and the denominator in a fraction, like if they straight up are the same, then it equals one. But if they're close to the same, then it's close to one. So if these areas are about the same, the convex hull ratio is close to one. And this is regarded as good, right? That means that the shape you're talking about is a fairly ordinary looking shape. Uh, but if the convex hull area is much bigger, so if the convex hull area is much bigger, this is what happens in like a wormy shape, then uh, the fraction is close to, can anybody say? This will be a fraction in which the denominator is much bigger than the numerator. Uh, what's the value of that? This would be something like two over a million. This would be close to, any masters of fractions out there? I would say this is close to zero. If you have a fraction where the denominator is way bigger than the numerator, that means you're dividing a small number divided by some really big number. That's going to be close to zero, all right? And this is regarded as bad. All right, so generally speaking, if I were to kind of summarize this, the convex hull ratio, when you write it like as a decimal, is a number. Number? 
between 0 and 1. And 0 indicates a weird wiggly shape. And 1 indicates a nice sort of compact shape. This is the word that they use when people talk about gerrymandering shapes. The shapes uh, in a fair map should not be ridiculous wiggly things. They should be more or less nice little blobs, compact kind of shapes. All right? This is the convex hull ratio. So we are going to talk about um, measuring the convex hull ratio of various shapes. Now we had like the handout from last time. We could try to measure these ratios for all of those shapes. You will immediately realize there is one sort of hard step about this. So I will just write again the convex hull ratio as a fraction. You know, you are going to be, I'm going to ask you to do this on your homework and such. It's the original area divided by the convex hull area. And the hardest part about doing this, if I just show you a shape and ask you to calculate this number, the hardest thing, the hardest part is just measuring the areas. Like for example, if I draw a shape something like this, I think this one probably its convex hull ratio is, is pretty close to one because it's not a, a silly sort of wormy type shape. But if I ask you specifically, measure the area of that shape and then also measure the area of the convex hull so that you can make that fraction that you see at the top there, you will immediately say to me, how am I supposed to measure the area of that shape? This is not a normal like mathematical shape which has a normal kind of area formula. Like those are the only if it were a square, then you probably know how to measure the area. But this is a weird shape. So how to get this area? And unfortunately, the answer is uh, there isn't really an easy way to measure the area of a weird shape. I don't know if any of you have ever, have you ever had to do this in your real life? Probably not. Um, I'm not sure that I have ever had to do this in my real life. But uh, anyway, there are various techniques and I would like to bring, uh, bring to the table sort of a very old fashioned technique for measuring areas of things. I have, see I have a lot of handouts today. This is something that in my opinion is a little annoying to do, but it actually works very well. So we're going to go for it. This is a method of measuring areas of weird shapes. Something that um, you know you could easily teach a kid how to do this. Um, they don't typically do this in uh, high school. But they could. So I have a little handout to explain, but we can talk about it here. This is all about how to measure the area of a weird shape. And we can use, there are various like instruments that have been invented to try and do this in real life. We can use what's called a dot planimeter. This is something that any one of us could have thought up on our own. It's not a complicated idea at all. Uh, I have a picture of this handout so we can kind of look at it together. Where is it? Here it is. Give me that. Okay. Here I have a version of this thing that I just handed out. Uh, the idea here is, let's say I have a weird shape and I want to know its area. Now, traditionally in a math class, you learn formulas for finding areas of shapes, but those formulas are not equipped to handle just some random weird shape that you encounter like in real life. How would you measure the shape of a random area that you encounter in real life? Here is the totally stupid idea, but it, but it works. 
you just lay a grid of dots over the shape. Let's say you, um, and people, when, when people do this like in real life back in the day, nowadays you can use computers to measure weird areas like this, but back in the day, of course, they, they didn't have that. Um, you can make sort of dots on a transparency and then just lay the dots down on top of your shape. And if you wanna know how big the shape is, you just count up the dots. This is kind of annoying to do in real life, but back in the old days, there were people who did this, you know, scientists, if they wanted to measure the area of something, this was basically the only way to do it. You lay the dots down, and then you sort of imagine that each of those dots lies at the middle of a circle, uh, where these, if the dots are spaced at say one centimeter apart, then these circles each have area of one square centimeter. And if you count up how many dots are on the inside, that's more or less the same as counting up the area of the inside. It's not exactly equal because of these little bits on the sides. But if you think about it, actually, these areas that you're counting, the dots, sometimes they over count the area. Like here, the, the square is actually stretching beyond the true area. Sometimes they under count the area. But if you do this on a big shape, uh, on average, you would expect the over counts and the under counts to kind of balance each other out. And this turns out to be actually uh, fairly accurate so in this, in this example, I just counted up the little dots and there were 17 of them inside the heart. And so the area of this shape is about 17 square centimeters or whatever the, whatever the units are that you're using. All right, this is called the dot planimeter. It is a totally stupid idea, but it actually works and there are not all that many better ideas. Actually, one of the main things that you use calculus for is calculating areas like that, but that is much, much harder to do. So in terms of like ways of finding areas that basically anybody could do without special training, this is actually, um, like I said, it's a, it's a dumb idea, but it, it totally works. And there aren't very many better ideas than that. All right, uh, one little thing that you will often uh, imagine. So what you have to do to find the area of this heart is you just count up all these little dots. Which ones are on the inside? You count up how many are on the inside. Uh, you will eventually uh, arise at a situation where you, you wonder to yourself, what if the dot is on the line? So if you think about a dot on the line, like maybe uh, right here, this dot is on the line, right? Now over here, I didn't count it. I guess, I suppose I just judged that that was slightly outside the region, although that's kind of a, a judgment call. But you should, you should uh, the idea here is, a dot which is on the line kind of represents half of this area being counted. And so really, if you're counting the dots, technically speaking, if you see a dot on the line, you should count it as one half. Now this is a little annoying to keep track of halves while you're counting. And so for that reason, people came up with this slight, slightly fancier version of the dots. Here we have half of the dots are kind of uh, empties and half of the dots are kind of fulls and you can see that on your your page there and the rule is rather than counting um, each dot on the line as a half you count all the dots on the line but only the ones that look like this so the rule is if the dot is on the line and it looks like this one that is with with only the uh, sort of outline dot then you count it you count all the ones on the inside the dots on the line, you only count the ones that look like this. So if I were counting on this shape, maybe we can all do this together. It helps to kind of mark them off with your pencil so that you don't lose track. I'm <coughs> going to count all the dots on the inside plus the ones on the line which look like this, but not the ones on the line which look like this. So I count one, two, three, four, five, now this one here is on the line, but it looks like the line one, so I'm gonna count it. So that's six, seven, eight, nine, <coughs> 10. That one, uh, I'm not going to count. Uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, maybe I'll count this one. Does that count as being on the line or outside? There's always a bit of a judgment call here. I'm gonna say that's on the outside. I lost count here. That was 14, I believe. And then I go 15, 16, 17. All right, I did not count these two because they're on the line, but they look like that. All right, this is how you do it. I got 17, so the area of that one is 17. All right, this is a bit of a pain to do in practice, but it's, I mean, it's very easy, and it gives you 
pretty good answers as far as measuring the area of something. All right, any questions about that? This is called the dot planimeter, an old, uh, you know, historical thing. People used to do this a lot. Nowadays, we don't so much anymore. All right, uh, I would like to do some examples then, and I thought it might be fun to calculate convex hull ratios. I'm going to start on this side this time. What I have here is pictures <laughs> of all of the districts, um, the five districts for the state of Connecticut. And I would like to find the convex hull ratios of each. All right, this one I got. Come on now. Okay, so what we have here are the five congressional districts. Plus, we also have just, I just for fun, I put the entire state of Connecticut. We can find the convex hull ratio of that also. So I want to find the convex hull ratio of each shape. And this will allow us to judge which ones are sort of fairer than the other ones. So remember, near zero is good. Uh, near, sorry, near zero is bad, and near one is good, and you know, in between is in between. That's uh, that's how this works. So let's all do number one together. All right. Now this involves counting the dots, and there is at some level some kind of judgment call about whether it's on the line or not. So your count, if you're doing this on the homework or something. Your count is not necessarily going to be exactly the same as my count, and that's totally fine. If you're within you know, one or two, um, then uh, I don't mind at all. But let's try and do this one all together here. So first of all, I'm going to count the original area. And then I'm also going to count the convex hull area. And then we're going to just divide them and make a fraction out of it. So the original area, count up the whole shape here. Um, I want all the dots on the inside, plus additionally the ones on the boundary, which look like those empty circles. So I'm going to mark them off as I go. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, oh, not that one, 25, 26. I got 27. Did I miss any? When I counted them up, I got 27. I hope you got something similar. Notice that, for example, I did not count this one, which is on the line, because it looks, <coughs> it looks like that. That's sort of the, the dot uh, only on the inside. So you should not count it when it's on the line. But I did count, say, these two, which are on the line, because they, those are the types which you count on the line. All right, so the original area I got is 27. Anybody got questions about that? I know it might be hard for you to count in your head while you're listening to me. But this is, this is what I got for the original area. Like I said, if you're off by one or two, it's fine. It's not going to cause a big, I mean, your answer will be technically different from mine, but it's not going to be uh, wildly different. All right? And the convex hull area. All right, so for the convex hull area, you need to, first of all, draw the convex hull. And this is why we did all these sort of silly examples last time. Draw the convex hull by filling in all the little bits which are sticking uh, sort of any region. So all of this stuff needs to be filled in with the convex hull. So I'm going to draw, maybe I'll change my color here just to clarify. I'm going to connect up there across that diagonal. All of those points on the inside now need to be included. Uh, also to make the convex hull, you should add in this region up here. And there's a lot of kind of little little bitty regions. You have to, again, imagine you're wrapping a rubber band around this shape. You have to go all the way around the outside of the shape and fill in all the little any bits. I think it will look something like that. So this is the convex hull, which I have outlined. 
And now I need to count the dots which are inside the entire new area. Now, I'm gonna save a little bit of effort here because I have already counted 27 of these dots. So I'm gonna start counting at 27 and then just count additionally the new dots which I got after drawing the convex hull. And I'm gonna mark these off in, in, uh, in blue here. So I had 27 first, now I go 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. I think that's it, I got 41. All right, I started with 27 uh, of the original ones, but then I got you know a bunch more of these new ones. The convex hull area is 41. That's what I said, right? I think so. All right, again, I hope that you get numbers that are more or less the same. I mean, if your number is not exactly the same, that's okay. All right. And then my final answer would be the fraction. So the convex hull ratio for this shape is 27 divided by 41. And I'm gonna just get my calculator app here just so that we can compare one to the next. I'm gonna divide, 27 divided by 41 is as a decimal 0.658 something something, all right? So how good is this shape on a scale of you know, zero to one? It's somewhere in the middle, 0.65, all right? Remember on this scale, one is the best, zero is the worst. Any questions about how, uh, how we just did that? All right, can I have you guys try and do the other ones here? I would like to, we should be able to compare these numbers. Actually, before we go anywhere, number two, just looking at the shape, do you expect the, the final answer for number two, should it be less? or more than this one? You should be thinking, is this one actually closer to being a good shape or closer to being wormy? I would say, in my opinion, number one is a wormier type shape. So I expect number two to be like a more good shape, which means its value should be closer to one. So hopefully when you do number two, your final answer should be greater than 0.65, whatever. Of course, you need a calculator to get the final answer. See what you think.
talk to your friends you may find they got slightly different numbers than you did that's all right All right, it looks like people are doing pretty well. Maybe I will, I know it's, this is not enough time for you to have done all of them, and I also know it's really a pain to sit here counting the dots for minutes on end. So I'm gonna tell you what I got, and hopefully you got something close to mind. So number two, we can talk about um, how to draw the convex hull. Well, I'll tell you, in this case, my original, when I counted them, my original area was 32. And as I was walking around, I saw some variations. If you're, if you're off by just a couple, then that's, that's probably fine. Um, and the convex hull area, if you're off by like 10, then probably you were doing something wrong. Um, and I would be happy to chat about it. So uh, let's make sure we draw the convex hull properly. The convex hull should be obtained by <laughs> connecting by straight lines. Remember, I am imagining that I'm wrapping a rubber band around this shape. And so you have to actually do a lot of little bitty bits uh, on the, along the bottom here. Although they don't really matter just because they, the, the dots are not captured by these little bits. Something like that is the convex hull. I hope that, I saw some people drawing lines like, like that, um, which is not the way it should, it shouldn't be bent out like that. The convex hull is obtained by stretching rubber bands around. And also, some people like to do this kind of rectangular sort of lines, but that's not the way that a rubber band goes. You should return that rubber band to the rubber band store if it works like that. All right, uh, so when I did the convex hull area for this one, ah, sorry, I got, um, I got 38, giving me a ratio of 32 over 38, which I put into my calculator and it said 80, uh, 0.84 or you could say 84% if you like. All right, again, if you have something slightly different from, from my answer, that's probably okay. It is, um, it's definitely important that this is a bigger number than that one, right? That's because this, this shape is a more compact, nice shape than the uh, district one shape, all right? Uh, let me just tell you what I got for the other numbers. I don't think we need to go through these other ones in complete detail just because it's, 
it'll take a while to do them all. Maybe I'll draw the convex hull just for fun here. Again, there's a lot of little bitty bits down the sides here, but it's basically going to be like this. It has to go all the way across the bottom and all the way up the side. If you draw these lines different than I did, you, they may affect your count. You, would, you might be capturing more dots than you should or fewer dots than you should. Anyway, for this one, I got a convex hull ratio of 0.65. So this one is, is uh, coming out fairly close to number one in terms of its convex hull ratio. The state of Connecticut itself is almost already convex. <laughs> this little, this little you know, jug handle or whatever they call it um, needs a little bit of adjustment as far as the convex hull goes, but uh, basically doing that makes it convex. And there's a little, any, uh, any true Connecticut fans know about this little notch up here? This is a weird uh, little thing. You have to technically fill that in. Anyway, for this one, I got a convex hull ratio of 0.88. This is very high. Remember, one is the sort of theoretically perfect. Um, 0.88 is quite close to one. And for these other twos, maybe I'll just tell you the answers that I got. I got uh, 0.74 for that one and 0.73 for this one. All right. I hope so. I, I know probably nobody actually did all of them because that wasn't really enough time. But I hope that uh, everybody's clear on the procedure. It's, it's, uh, it's totally simple to do. Um, it will drive you a little bit crazy if you have to do this a lot. So don't do this all night long. Any, uh, any questions about that? I hope it makes sense to everybody. Great. All right, we got about 10 more minutes. I think that's enough time to start talking about um, our next measure of sort of weirdness of shapes. All right, this was the convex hull ratio, and it's all about the difference between the area versus the area of the convex hull, all right? Um, the next one that I wanna talk about is another kind of ratio, uh, and it has a fancier name. This is called the isoperimetric quotient. <coughs> which I'm going to write as IQ. The isoperimetric, sorry, that's an ugly Q. Isoperimetric quotient. This also is a ratio. I mean, it's, it's called a quotient, which means the same thing, a uh, fraction. Um, this one is a fraction involving <coughs> areas like we said before but it's just the the original area the area of the original shape this one doesn't have anything to do with the convex hull and so this fraction involves the area of the original shape and also the perimeter and that's why this this weird word at the beginning you can see that it has something to do with the perimeter so this is how you can remember what this strange word is all about. It's about the perimeter and the area, all right? And this is based on another idea about how you could measure how sort of wormy a shape is. For example, if I have, um, say, a shape that looks like that, this, in my opinion, is, is sort of a good shape in terms of like being a, being a ridiculous wormy shape or not. This one, um, it has, um, I would just say this has a certain area and perimeter. I hope everybody remembers what perimeter means. That's the distance along the line. If you measure the distance of the curved line surrounding the shape, all right? So this has a certain area and a perimeter, but I'm gonna draw another shape, and I'm gonna try to draw a sh another shape which has a similar area. This is not, not really easy to do in a, in a uh, precise way, but how about something like this? This is a silly 
kind of wormy type shape. Now this shape, its area, actually that's probably, can I take away one or two of these fingers? Doesn't really matter, but uh, I'm gonna take away this part. Ah, sorry. All right, I'm gonna say this has a similar area. as the uh, shape above. I don't know if that's actually true, but I tried to make it so that the area of this kind of four-fingered thing is similar to the area of the uh, first one. But what about the perimeters? I would say the perimeter of the second one is far bigger than the perimeter of the first one, right? The perimeter is the distance of the curved line around the outside. <coughs> All right, so this one has a similar area, but much bigger perimeter. Right? And this is the way, another way to tell the difference between a normal looking shape and a weird wiggly wormy shape is that wormy shapes tend to have much bigger perimeter kind of than it, than it deserves, right? This shape, it has a certain area and a certain <laughs> perimeter. This is more or less the same area, but the perimeter is like far, far bigger, all right? So the, uh, the moral of the story here is a compact shape has, I will just sort of put this in quotes, a normal area and perimeter, but a wormy shape has a perimeter that's way too big. Right, the perimeter is kind of much bigger than it ought to be in a uh, in a wiggly, wormy shape. This actually somehow I, I don't know if any of you are experts in biology. This is kind of why worms are shaped like worms. It's because they like to absorb water through their skin, and so they want to have a lot of skin um, for uh, in comparison to their body shape. Um, so a worm likes to be a worm shape. I imagine that worms like being worms. It's the reason why they look like worms. It's because they have a lot of uh, skin, and the skin is where they get their uh, that that sweet worm juice that they like. I don't know what they like. I'm not a biologist. All right, a wormy shape has a perimeter that's way too big. This is the basic idea, and so the um, the isoperimetric quotient, which I write as IQ. There's a, a few details that I will get into next time, but I'll just say is basically the area divided by the perimeter. That, that is not technically, not exactly correct, but this is the basic idea. And the idea is if the perimeter is super big, this fraction will be close to zero. And if the area and the perimeter are more or less in line with each other, then this fraction will be close to one. So it's the, the idea is similar to the convex hull. I think maybe I'll leave it at that. We'll get into some real details next time. Uh, please let me know, like I said before, if you want to talk about grades, I would be happy to tell you how you're doing. Uh, and, sorry, I have printed out the next uh, assignment because this also involves a bunch of pictures. So, all right, Andy.